So today we're going to cover chapter 11, section 5, and we're going to cover volume of prisms and volume of cylinders. Now, you're also going to see, if you notice on the title of this slide, that it says we're going to also do the surface area of cylinders. However, surface area will not be on your test on Friday. We are going to quiz you on a um, surface area next week because our book does not cover surface area of prisms or cylinders, but we're going to add in a little supplementary lesson in order to get you ready for a standardized test if you happen to see that um, when you take an SAT or an ACT. So the first thing we're going to do is define volume. The volume of a solid is always going to be the number of cubic units contained in its interior. Volume is always going to be measured in cubic units. So if they do not give you a unit on there, you're just going to label it as cubic units. If they give you inches or centimeters, it would be cubic centimeters or inches. Another thing that's on this slide is called Cavallari's principle. I'm not going to test you and say, what is it? But what it states, if you see this on a standardized test, is that if two solids have the same height and the same cross-sectional area at every level, then they're gonna also have the same volume. So both of the figures down at the bottom have the same cross-sectional area and the same height, so they would also have the same volume. Now, again, when you're writing your units, you can either write out the word cubic or you could put just units to the third power. When we did area, we saw that the units were always squared. So the next slide actually has the formula for volume of a prism. So when you calculate the volume of a prism, you're gonna see it always represented as capital B, which is gonna represent the area of your base shape multiplied by the height. Now, in order to do the volume, you're gonna to need to know your basic area formulas. We've already seen the area of a rectangle, area of a square, triangle, and in section 11.3, remember we covered area of polygons. So you may get a solid that has a hexagon base, and you would have to calculate the area of that hexagon. And if you remember, that formula for area of a polygon is you're going to either memorize it as one half the apothem times the perimeter, or you can also use one half apothem times number of sides times the side length. Because remember, this NS is really just the perimeter of your polygon. So again, you're gonna to need to calculate the base shapes area and then multiply it by the height of your prism. Now, in the homework tonight, you're gonna to see a picture of a triangular prism. And remember when we talked about this, sometimes when they give you the pictures of the prisms, they're not always sitting on their base. And that's gonna be the situation in one of the homework questions where it's a triangular prism but it's gonna be sitting on one of the lateral faces. It's gonna be sitting on a rectangle. So you're gonna to need to do the formula for area of a triangle, which will be your base shape, and then multiply it by the height of that prism. So in this particular picture here on the left, notice my base shape here is a rectangle. So my capital B here, this is gonna be the formula for area of a rectangle and you can either have memorized it as length times width or base times height. Just don't get confused because we have the H here, which is the height of the prism, and then you would have the height of the base shape. So here, you can either memorize it as length times width times height or base times height times height, but just know that this second height is the height of the prism. Now the figure on the right is actually another prism. Notice it looks like it's slanted. This is called an oblique prism when it's slanted like this. 
Remember your height or your altitude always needs to be perpendicular. It always needs to be indicated by a right angle. So this would be my height of my prism and it's called an oblique prism. And it looks sort of like it's slanted. This BH here is just the capital B. Okay, so this is the capital B and this is the capital B. And then, so this is the capital B, the capital B, and then we have the height of the prism. Okay, now we're gonna do the formula or identify first the definition of a cylinder. So a cylinder is just like a prism. The only difference is now instead of a polygon base, it's got a circle base. So, and the right cylinder here, that's gonna be the segment that joins the center of the circular bases, which is also known as the height. So let's say I put a dot here for the centers, and then this segment that joins it, this is called the altitude or the height of my cylinder. So for the cylinders, we're gonna to need to calculate the area of the base shape, which is a circle, and that's why they gave me a radius, and then we'll multiply it by the height. The formula is still the same. It's capital BH, but this time the capital B, the area of that base shape is a circle, so it's pi r squared. And then it's multiplied by the height of the cylinder. We're gonna see this formula officially coming up in two slides. Okay, so this is the slide that has surface area on it. I will cover it again next week, um, but I just wanted to show you because it was included in these notes. So the lateral area of a cylinder, let me go ahead and draw a cylinder for you. So I'm gonna draw my cylinder. Now, here where it's referring to the lateral area of the cylinder, what they're referring to is this part of it. Then it also has its two circular bases, and that's how they get this part of the formula. It's pi r squared times two. Now, as far as the lateral area, if you think about them taking the sides of that cylinder and unfold it, it actually becomes a rectangle. And the top of the rectangle, that's this part of the formula, the two pi r. And if you recognize this, 2 pi r is actually the circumference of this circle. And then it's multiplied by the height. So the height would be over here. So this would be the height. And then this distance around this edge here, this is the circumference. And let me show you with a piece of paper. Again, what you can think of this is, this is 2 times the base plus the lateral area. But we're gonna see more surface area next week. So the slide has the formula for volume and this will be on the test. So the volume of a cylinder, again, capital B times the height. But again, my base shape here is a circle. So the capital B is pi r squared. So we're gonna do the area of the base times how tall the cylinder is. And again, it can be an oblique cylinder, which looks like this slanted cylinder. Again, the height will always be indicated by a right angle. It's not gonna be a slanted height. It always has to have the perpendicular symbol, the right angle. So I'm gonna skip, I'm not gonna do B and C because that'll be next week. I'm gonna do the area of the base though. So in my picture here, my height of my cylinder is seven. The radius of my circle base is five. So to find the area of the base, which is the capital B, I need to find the area of this circle, which is pi r squared. And my radius is five, so pi, times five squared, and left in terms of pi, it's 25 pi, and these are centimeters squared. This is area. Now, if it says to round to the hundreds place, 
Then we would use our calculator and 25 times pi gives me 78.539. So rounded to the hundreds place, the three nine um, becomes a four. So centimeters squared. So just read how they want it left. If it says exact, you leave it with the pi, or if they say in terms of pi. Now we're gonna do the volume. And again, volume, remember, is capital B times the height. And again, I just found the area of the base, 25 pi, and my height of my cylinder is seven. So now I just have to multiply 25 times seven, and I get 175 pi, and now it's cubic centimeters. And if it says to round to the hundreds place, 175 times pi gives me 549.778, so 0.78. Now you can either do like I did and write out the word cubic or put centimeters to the third power. And again, just read the instructions on how it wants you to leave your answer, whether in terms of pi or rounding to the hundreds place. So the next one, it says, the vol find the volume of a square prism that has a base edge length of five feet and a height of 12 feet. Now, notice no picture was provided. So on the test, you may get questions like this where a picture is not provided. If it helps you to draw a picture, then by all means do that. But again, it's not totally necessary. I always like to draw a picture. It helps give me a little bit better visual. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw a square prism. Remember, volume is always cubed. So again, the formula is capital B times H. My base shape was a square, so five times five, and then multiply by the height, which is 12, and I get 300 cubic feet. So the next one, it says to find the volume of the puzzle piece shown in cubic units. Now, in the homework tonight, they're going to refer to these figures that look like they're like some stacked um, solids. This is called a composite figure. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate it and then find the volume of each section and then add it up together. It doesn't really matter how you divide it up. Um, I always look for maybe the most obvious. And for me, it looks like if I go ahead and cut this little piece of the puzzle off, I could find the volume of this piece, and then I'll find the volume of the rectangular prism that's at the bottom. So if I do the top piece, again, same formula, BH, but notice here, my base shape is gonna be a square, so it's gonna be one times one, times one, which is the height, and that's gonna give me one unit cubed. Now for the bottom, for this piece, part of it down here, I'm gonna do capital BH. This could be my base shape here, the three and the one, and this could be my height. So three times one, times two, and the volume of the bottom piece of that puzzle is six units cubed. And now to find the whole puzzle piece, I need to add one plus six, and the puzzle piece will be seven units cubed. You can also write cubic units. So you will be finding the volume of composite figures. You'll just find each section separately and then go back and add them. You'll also need to find missing pieces. They might give you the volume already calculated and they may ask you to find a height or a radius. And that's what we're gonna do on the next example. They're giving us the volume of the cylinder and they want us to find the length of the radius. 
So let me go ahead and give myself a visual. Let me go ahead and draw in my cylinder. So they gave me the height and my height is 18 inches. They also gave me the volume already calculated and the volume was 684 pi and this was cubic inches. So again, I'm using the same formula, the V equals BH. But again, remember when it's a cylinder, your capital B is pi r squared. So that's what we need to find is the length of that radius. So let's go ahead and fill in what they've given us. They gave us the volume, 684 pi. The formula for area of a circle is pi r squared and my height was 18. Now, my goal here is to get r all by itself. Notice the pi, the r squared, and the 18 are all being multiplied. So to undo all that multiplication, I'm going to be dividing. Um, you can do 18 pi all in one step. Go ahead and divide. I'll just do it in two steps. So I'm going to divide both sides by, eight, uh, by pi. And now I'm left with 684 is equal to radius squared times 18. And now I'm going to divide both sides by 18. And now I'm left with radius squared equals 38 after I divide 684 by 18. Now I didn't want radius squared. I want radius. So I got to square root it. So the radius is equal to the square root of 38, and this would be inches. Now, if it said leave it exact, you would leave it in simplest radical form, and this is simplest radical form. If it says round to the hundreds place, then it would be 16.16. So again, just read how they want it left. If it's exact, simplest radical form. If it's round to the hundreds place, then you use the square root button on your calculator. Next one is an oblique prism. Again, it's just a slanty prism. Now, in the homework tonight, they're gonna give you an example of a rectangular prism, I mean a triangular prism, but it's gonna be sitting on its rectangle side, and you may think the base is a rectangle. But remember, it's the shape you have two of. So I have two triangles, so the eight is actually the height of my prism, and my base shape here is this triangle. So I could say that the nine is the base of that triangle, and this could be the height of it. So again, I'm still doing capital B-H, where the H is the height of the prism. Now, my base shape, my capital B, this is a triangle. So I'm going to be doing one half base times height or base times height divided by two. Either way, doesn't matter. So if I want to do the base shape, my capital B is going to be one half, nine times five, and then times the height of the whole prism, which is eight. And now I can go ahead and multiply. If they had asked you to find the area of the base shape first, this actually becomes 45 over two. And then times the eight now. And once I multiply all that, I get 180 cubic meters. You could also do 180 meters to the third. If you weren't using a calculator, you might want to simplify the 2 and the 8 and make that a 4 and a 1. But again, you're using your calculator. Okay, next we're going to talk about similar solids. 
So we've already covered similar figures before, but now they're gonna be solids and they're gonna be two solids of the same type with equal ratios of corresponding linear measures. And those corresponding linear measures could be heights, they could be radii, um, they could be one of the base dimensions, but it'll be a linear measure. And the ratio of the corresponding linear measures of the two similar solids, remember is called the scale factor. If the two similar solids have a scale factor of K, then the ratio of their volumes will be K cubed. We saw this before when we did the similar figures and we did area questions. And remember area, it was always the scale factor squared. Now it's gonna be for volume, it's gonna be the scale factor cubed. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the scale factor. It could just be a ratio of the side lengths. But again, it's gotta be the corresponding linear measures. Now, when we did this before, this was a question, when I gave you the area question, that a lot of people got wrong because you forgot to square that scale factor. Now the common mistake is you'll forget to cube the scale factor. Okay, so here it says that prism C and D are similar, and they want us to find the missing volume of prism D. So again, what I need to do is find the ratio of the corresponding side lengths. So again, it doesn't matter if you do C over D or D over C, just stay consistent. So if I do C over D, in order to get that ratio or that K value, 12 over three simplifies four to one or just four. Then if I wanted to find K cubed, I would take four, cube it, and I get 64. Now what I'm gonna do is because I did prism C over prism D for the corresponding sides, when I set up my next equation, I need to stay consistent. So I'm gonna do volume of C, over volume of D is equal to K cubed. So now I'll fill it in. 1,536, I don't know volume D, I could call that X. My K value was four and I can cube it. So now I could go ahead and I like to set this up as a proportion. So then now what I can do is cube the four and now cross multiply. So 64X is equal to 1,536 divide by 64 and X, which is my volume of D is 24. So the volume of D is 24 meters cubed. Now, if you prefer to just put it in as a proportion to begin with, what you could also do, another way to do this, is vol if you wanna do C over D, 1536, and I didn't know D, and then side length of D, of C, over side length of D, but remember to cube it. So you can do it this way as well. And then simplify, I would simplify before you square it or cube it. And then it turns into the exact same thing that we had before. So it's right back at this spot. So if you'd rather set it up with the ratio of the corresponding sides, you can do that. So you could have also done bottom over top. You could have done D over C. If you set your proportion up that way, it would have been X over 1536 and then three over 12. 
and then you could simplify it. You could flip it either way, it doesn't matter because you're gonna end up solving it as a proportion. So that is it for the notes on 11.5. We have one more section to cover before Friday's test.